reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 1 to 30. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked. Jesus, he asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away. Crucify him. Shall I crucify you? King Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. May I just make a comment before I finish? John is the only gospel writer who was on the scene, and he was a witness of this. Um, all the disciples fled in the garden. And then it was Peter and John, and then after Peter denied the Lord three times, he went off by himself, and John is the lone of the twelve that were a witness, a first-hand witness. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus, carrying his own cross. He went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened it to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one free to them with the other garment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. 
When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you on this day where we recognize and concentrate upon the work that was done on the cross and how our wrath was ended because of your Son who took it for us, I pray that you would enlighten our hearts, embolden us, Lord, to be holy and to walk in holiness and help us Lord to remember that holiness only comes through obedience so then Lord help us to be an obedient people guide us through this service that we might be an honor and a blessing to your heart in Jesus name amen Hymn number 317, The Old Rugged Cross. <clears throat>
We have a reading from Isaiah 53. I just realized that my microphone is not plugged in. So just bear with me for a moment. projects pretty well, people hear me. <laughs> Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of Lord been revealed? We grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and he held him, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But we but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed by our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet, in, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him as, and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the Lord and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous, by his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I give, will give you him. A, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death, and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sins of many, and made interse intercession with the transgressors. this without the PowerPoint today. That's all right. Turn with me to 338. O oh, 
sacred head now wounded. Divide my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. 
but you, O oh Lord, be not far off. O oh, my strength, come quickly to help me. Deliver my life from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dogs. Rescue me from the mouth of the lions. Save me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will declare your name to my brothers in the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him, all you descendants of Israel. For he has not despised nor disdained the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but he has listened to his cry for help. From you come the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you will I fulfill my vow. The poor will eat and be satisfied. They who seek the Lord will praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules every nation. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive. Prosperity will serve him. Future generations will to be told about the Lord. They will reclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, for he has done it. had intended a video presentation, but since the equipment is not working, we are going to have Lindsay come and Lincoln has a reading. We're going to switch the two of them around. Okay. So uh, we're going to have Lindsay come and sing a song for us.
This comes from Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters are come, for the waters are come to unto my soul. I sink in deep, mire where there is no standing. I am come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary of my crying. My throat, my, my throat is dry. Mine eyes fall, fail while I wait for my God. They that hate me without a cause are most are most more than the hairs of mine head. And, and sorry, they, they they that would destroy me being mine, and these wrongfully are mighty that I restored that walk, which I took not away. O oh God, thou knowest my foolishness, and my sins are not are not hid from thee. Let not them that wait on thee, O Lord, O Lord God of hosts, be ashamed for my sake. Let not those that seek thee be confounded. For my sake, O God of Israel, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, shame hath recovered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the for zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. And the, and the reproaches of them that reproach thee are fallen upon me. When I wept and chastened, chastened my soul while fasting, that was to my reproach. I made sack, sack, sackcloth also my garment, and I, become, and I became a pro proverb to them. They that sit in the gate speak against me, and I was the psalm of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is unto thee, O Lord, in the, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of thy mercy, hear me in the truth of thy salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be, the, let me be delivered from them that hate me. And out of the deep waters, let not the water flood overflow me. Neither let the, let the deep Swallowed me up, and let not the pit shut her mouth upon me. Hear me, O Lord, for thy loving kindness is good. Turn unto me according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. And hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speed, speedily. Draw nigh unto my soul, and redeem it. Deliver me because of mine enemies. Thou hast known my reproach and my shame. And my dishonor, mine, mine adversaries, are all before thee. Reproach hath broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. And I looked for some one to take, some to take pity, but there was none. And I looked for comforters, but I found none. They gave me also gale, gall, for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare. Before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened, and they see not, and make their loins continually to shake. Pour out thine integration, indigration, sorry, upon them, and let thy wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their habitation be des desolate, and let none, none dwell in their tents. For they persecute him whom thou hast smitten, and they and they talk to the grief of those whom thou hast wounded. And iniquity unto their iniquity, and let them not come unto the into the righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteousness. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let thy salvation, O God, set me upon high. I will praise the name of God with a, with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or a bullock that hath horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and your heart shall live that seek God. For the Lord heareth the poor and despiseth not his prisoners. Let the heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moveth therein. For God will save Zion, and will build the cities of Judah, that they may have dwell there, and have it in position. 
The seed also of his servants shall inherit it, and they that love his name shall dwell therein. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer before we go to the message. Father, uh, this morning, or this afternoon, we have have uh, experienced some technical issues, Lord, but that's just presentation. Father, we love you. Please hear our prayers. Please hear our hearts. Please speak to us through your word that all, Lord, that is done this afternoon would be an honor and a glory to your heart, for you are the audience, Lord, with whom we are concerned. In Jesus' name, amen. Titus chapter 2, and uh, we're looking at verses 11 through 14. Uh, it's Titus is kind of midway through the New Testament. Timothy, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then Titus. Starting at verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing and glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all unwickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do that which is good. Um, the focus for the sake of the theme of our message today is verse 14, that he died to purify for himself a people. He did not die simply to purify a people. He died to purify a people for himself. This puts an entirely different uh, understanding to the scripture than what most modern preaching is doing. Most of the modern preaching says that Jesus died to help you, and the result of that modern teaching is that most people, knowing then that he died and that they are now helped, they see no point in the last part of the verse. A people that are eager to do good. Now good, according to the scripture, is limited to God. For Jesus said when he was called good teacher, why do you call me good? There is none good except God alone. And so no one can do good as the Bible defines good unless he does so through God. Otherwise, he may be doing a kindness, he may be doing a benevolent work of some kind, and other people may label it as good, but it does not satisfy the righteous requirement of the scripture. In order for us to understand how it is that uh, Christ purified for himself a people, we must ask ourselves a couple of questions. What was the crucifixion? What did the crucifixion do? And how should we respond to it? First of all, what the crucifixion was. The crucifixion was an act of obedience. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I, I lay down my life only to take it up again. This command I received from the Father that I should lay down my life and he has given me power to take it up again. So this was an act of obedience primarily. However, the cross has been characterized to you. It has been characterized to you in many humanistic uh, viewpoints that uh, Jesus died to help people, 
that Jesus died to take away sin. All of these things are great side benefits. I'm not going to diminish the fact that these are certainly side benefits. But the purpose of his death, the reason that he died, was primarily because he was an obedient servant. And as we see in Isaiah 53, which was read to us earlier, and as we see in Isaiah 52, Christ is the great servant, and the servant must suffer. The servant must be abused. The servant must, as it says in Isaiah 53, be crushed. The servant was there to be obedient. The servant was not there primarily to help you. In being obedient, he helped you. In being obedient, he was kind to you. In being obedient, he was gracious. In being obedient, he did indeed take away your sins. But when we shift things ever so slightly and make the center focus that Jesus died for our sins primarily, we miss the greater point of the gospel. And the greater point of the gospel is that Christ has purified us for himself, that he may enjoy us as his church, as his community, as his congregation. His desire was to enjoy us. In order to enjoy us, he had to purify us. And why enjoy us? Because we are his creation, the work of his hands. And he loves us. But because of his great love for the Father, Jesus obeyed. The Father, it is to say then from the scripture, used Jesus' life as an offering and a propitiation for our sin so that he could purify a people for himself. He did not do what he did on the cross and thus purified the whole world. That is heresy. He purified only those who would be saved. Only those who he knew in his foreknowledge would be a part of his church. And if you have been regenerated and converted, you're a Christian now. Because God by his power has made you Christian. Then you celebrate and you live in the purification that was given to you on the cross. The crucifixion was also a fury of wrath. Make no mistake, this was not the wrath of men upon Jesus. This was the wrath of God upon Jesus. Jesus could have cared less about nails in his hands and a nail through his feet. He could have cared less about the straps on his back, the crown of thorns on his head, the spear in his side. He could have cared less about them. What made Christ so full of anguish was God withdrawing from him and crushing him under the weight of the wrath of every man, woman, and child that Christ would ever save from their sins. This is a tremendous weight that we have placed upon the shoulders of Jesus. If he had kept his relationship with God through the crucifixion and not become sin in our place, he would never have cried out with a loud voice, as the scripture says. He could have endured the nails and the crown of thorns and all the punishments if in the end he was not going to to be crushed by the Almighty God. That was the thing, my friends, 
that scared him in the Garden of Gethsemane. That was what caused his sweat and blood to mingle because he knew that he was about to face not men and not man's wrath, but the wrath of God himself for our sakes. An example that is given in a sermon that I have listened to by a gentleman named Paul Washer. He says that uh, looking at Fox's Book of Martyrs, you see that the early church, many of them, were marched to crosses and nailed to crosses, dipped in kerosene and lit on fire to provide light for the roads in Rome by Nero. As they approached the crosses and as they were marched to their deaths, it is recorded that they sang hymns of praise, that there was a joy in their heart that although they were about to suffer for a moment, that they were going to be with the Lord for eternity. Now this is not the same picture that we see of Christ. We see Christ going to the cross with confidence, but we see him at the cross and at Gethsemane in anguish, not for the physical pain that he was in, although it was tremendous, but for the spiritual pain that he was in. The amount of travail that it takes to bring forth a child only women can truly know. But the amount of travail that it took to bring forth the church, only Christ will ever know. And so in his travail, the church was born. Through his suffering and anguish, the church came into being. And as he died there, under the fury of God's wrath, he gladly took it so that you and I might come to life and might celebrate even today this new birth which was purchased on that first Good Friday. This was also a substitutionary atonement. I direct your attention here now to Romans chapter 5 and verses 8 through 10. Starting in verse 8. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were rec reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. While we were still God's enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He did not wait to go to the cross until we got our act together. Therefore, those of you that maybe more of them watching on Facebook than, than uh, watching here in the building. But if you get the idea that you'd ought to clean up your life before you come to church and seek out God, you do not know the scripture. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This substitution for you and I has its own effect 
Which brings us to the second part of the message, what the crucifixion did. It first of all fulfilled all righteousness. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, we read this. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. When he had fulfilled all righteousness, that is, he had obeyed God the Father to the fullest, not even withholding his own life, but giving it gladly to satisfy the wrath of God. He then sat down at the right hand of God. One sits down when one is done with one's work. He concluded his work and he sat at the right hand of God. In Romans chapter 3 and verses 23 to 26, we read this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. And so in one act, he was both the judge and the the one punished at the same time. Note the, the, uh, the wording here. Okay, God presented Christ as a sacrifice. Now, we will understand this better after Sunday's message coming up, okay? But God presented Christ. This means, again, what we said earlier that Christ was an obedient servant, even to the point of death. That is the primary lesson of the cross. You and I then, who must follow in the pattern of Christ, must also be obedient servants to God, even if it costs us. Even if it costs us finance, health, even if it costs our very life even if it costs us relationships and friendships, even if it costs us our job, all of these things we must remember are completely expendable and there's one thing not expendable, your relationship with God. It is the only thing that keeps you alive, that you have a relationship with the author of life. And so here we see that all righteousness was fulfilled by Christ. And we see that it was fulfilled by Christ's obedience. Then also, the crucifixion purified a church for Christ. Looking in Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, starting up at verse 25 to verse 27. We read here, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, or without wrinkle, and without blemish, but holy and blameless. See also here in the scripture, 
purifying for himself, cleansing for himself. Jesus did what he did on the cross to purify you for his own sake, for his own enjoyment. He did not do this just so that you could be free of sin and go out and gallivant all over the world doing whatever it is that you want to do with some kind of, of misguided, misinformed hope that you're going to go to heaven in the end no matter what it is you do here on this world. He purified for himself a people eager to do good. And to do good is to obey God because there is only one that is good and that is God and then there is only one will to follow that will ever produce anything good and that is the will of God. And so the crucifixion purified a church for Christ. And now Christ has a wonderful church that he himself paid for with his own suffering with his own life, so that you could be his precious possession. And you say, I don't want to be possessed of any other person on the face of this world. Well and good. It's not right. Because there is no person on this world worthy of possessing you. But God is worthy. He is righteous and holy in all that he does. And he wishes to present to himself a bride that is holy and blameless so that they might be joyfully holy together for all of eternity and that there may be no corruption, no blemish, no wrinkle or spot whatsoever. The crucifixion also hardened the hearts of the wicked. Take a look at Romans in chapter 9. And we're looking at verses 13 to 18. Romans chapter 9 verses 13 to 18. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What then shall we say? Is God unjust? No, not at all. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I choose to have compassion. It does not therefore depend upon human desire or effort but solely upon God's mercy. For Scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might display my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and hardens whom he wants to harden. This is a hard passage. There is no getting around it. This is a hard passage, but it is the truth nonetheless. And while you must wrestle with this truth, you must also acknowledge this truth as you wrestle with it. When the gospel is preached, it quickens the hearts of those that God wants to have mercy upon. And it also at the same time hardens those whose hearts are fully set against God so that they will not have even the slightest tear for the work of Christ on the cross. You have only to ask me about the gospel. 
and it will either result in me exuberantly explaining it to you, perhaps for even hours, if you were to be so gracious as to give me that much time. Or it may result in me weeping with such gratitude and love for God that I cannot control myself. For the work of God, the more I preach it, the more I teach it, and the more I study it and walk in it, the work of God is more and more transforming every day. The crucifixion fulfilled righteousness, purified the church, and hardened the wicked. We see this right at the cross, do we not? As Christ is being crucified, we see tenderness for those who are being saved. Mary, John, and the others that are gathered at the foot of the cross. And yet we see hardness like you wouldn't believe at the foot of the cross as the Pharisees whom God has destined to hell are walking past and they look up and they say, uh, you know, he said that God is his father, let God save him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Horrible things that they said, cold things that they said, as they were crucifying who they knew was an innocent man. We see it at the foot of the cross. The work of God in the gospel has twofold effect. It quickens those who are being saved and it hardens those who are destined for hell. Now often we hear these stories about somebody involved in a gang, somebody involved in some horrible sin, somebody whose life has been completely ruined and Yet they hear the gospel and all of a sudden it's like the song Amazing Love. Their eye diffuses a quickening ray and they wake in their dungeon flames with light. Their chains fall off. Their soul is free and they rise and go forth to follow Christ. And then you hear always of people who have done nothing but good things. They have been good mom, good dad. They have had a good job. They have raised a good family. They have a nice house and nice cars. And they hear the gospel and not a tear. Not a tear. Not a movement on their heart, but they are hardened about the gospel and determined even more to live the good life determined even more to enjoy a lifestyle that does not need God, even if it acknowledges Him from time to time, does not need Him. That is the gospel hardening what we would call the good people. And we see also the gospel enlightening what we might call the ne'er-do-wells. But sometimes the gospel hardens the ne'er-do-wells, and sometimes the gospel quickens those who were leading the good life, and they leave all of that behind and begin to take the criticisms and begin to take the degradation of their social position because they love Christ more than they love the good life that they used to have. We see it on both sides of the scale. The effect of the gospel will always be that it will quicken or bring to life those who are appointed to eternal life and it will harden those who are appointed to damnation. And you say, what can I do about it? Well, again, I bring you back to the scripture in verse 16. It does not therefore depend upon human desire or effort, but upon God's mercy. 
Why does God do this? He does this because you and I should have no space or room to boast whatsoever about our eternal life. He takes away all boasting. He takes away all pride. This is why it says God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So how then should we respond? First of all, pray for the pardon and the grace of God. As it says in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 6, we read there, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. If you desire eternal life, if you desire to love and to know God, call upon him. The Bible says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord out of a pure heart will be saved. We see also in the scripture that anyone that wants to come to Christ, Christ will never turn away. And therefore we see also here in Isaiah 55, call upon him while he may be found and while he is near. Seek him out. The Bible says if we seek for the Lord, as we would seek for gold or silver or precious stones, then we will find him. Here is the issue. Those with hard hearts will never seek him out, will never try to discover him. They only want the benefit of escaping hell and going to heaven. That's all that they want but they still want their own life and they still want to do what they want with their own life. Such a person should never believe that they have received anything from God at all. This pardon and grace that we seek teaches us, according to the scripture we read, our text teaches us to say no to ungodliness. If you want to know, have you received the grace of God? Is God making it harder and harder for you to guiltlessly engage in godlessness? It teaches us to say no to worldly passions. As you follow God, do you sense that he is taking away, bit by bit, piece by piece, all of your ambitions to be or have anything with regard to this world. Second thing that we should do in response, you, uh, we should live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. And our closing scripture will be 2 Timothy in chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 15 through 19. And here we read, do your best to present yourselves to God. In other words, study is what the King James says, and it ought to be that, although this 2011 NIV has got some things in it that I certainly have an issue with. Study to show yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenius and Philetus whom have departed from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with his inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and 
everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. As the Bible describes wickedness, it is everyone doing what they see right in their own eyes. Turn away from wickedness. If you turn away from it, the Bible says, then you know that God has saved you. Our response should be self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Now, this doesn't mean that you won't fail from time to time. You are being taught. According to the text scripture, this grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion. Teaching is a process. I would never throw an algebra question in front of a kindergartner and then berate them for not understanding it. Okay? But I would put in front of a kindergartner one plus one. And I would show him an apple and add another apple. And that the number two comes right after the number one. So one more number than two, or than one, is two. Okay? So I then would, as that child learned lessons, give them harder lessons and harder lessons. It's the same with God. When you have learned one thing, he moves you on to another thing. He wants you to know him. He wants you to be like him. When he died, he died to purify you for his fellowship and pleasure. He is not going to stop working until he has gotten what he died for. And as the Moravian call for missions goes, let me say it here. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward for his suffering. Let's pray. Merciful God, you have done a good work. You have taken away boasting from us. You have taken away pride from us. All we can do who have received mercy at your hand is simply to praise you and to thank you. So Lord, please hear our hearts. Thank you. Amen. Hymn number 32 as we close, please. We will sing verses 1, 3, and 5, since we have so many verses and are really pretty much at the end of our time.
Dismiss us with your blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be dismissed. Amen.